Hi, I'm Ray from the Radio Workshop, call sign G4NSJ, and this is my first podcast, so welcome. I want to talk about the early days of radio, in my case, pirate radio, that's how I started. Um, we're going back to the 1960s. Now, some of you will probably remember something called Echo Charlie. Echo Charlie was a pirate frequency, 6.6 megahertz, or these days, uh, 6600 kilohertz. And it was, in fact, a worldwide pirate frequency and still is. So 6.6 megs plus or minus a little bit. The equipment used was mainly 19 sets. Now, um, you may have heard of a 19 set, WS 19 set. They were used, they were produced in the 1940s and they were used in uh, tanks and I believe armoured vehicles during World War II. They were a transmitter receiver, all at one unit, covering two to eight megs and uh, they were very easy to modify. Well, there wasn't a lot of modification to do to them. They were freely available on the army surplus market and all you had to do basically was build a power supply. They came with a rotary converter and vibrator pack, but not many people actually use those. It was best to build a mains power supply. The only other thing you needed to do really was that they used a carbon microphone, which was all very well, but they, they used to use those in the old fashioned telephones. You're far better off getting rid of the carbon mic and fitting a crystal microphone. I remember ACOS used to make crystal mics and that's, that's the one everyone seemed to use. You get RF burns from the metal body. You get burns on your lips. That was due to the aerial not being matched properly, uh, the whole system not being grounded properly. Bear in mind, a lot of these pirates, as I was, you know, we were in our teens. We were learning, so we didn't know all about that sort of thing. But the 19 set was pretty easy to get on the air. And of course, it covered 6.6 .6 megs. So it was a, a brilliant radio to start off with. There were plenty of others. There were 22 sets, 18 set. That was a not a particularly good one. It was a man pack thing that you wear on your back uh, with batteries. So that wasn't too good. Yeah, 62 set, 22 set, 52 set. I had one of those, a lovely transmitter with an 813 valve in the, in the final. Lovely bit of equipment that I did actually get going. And a chap up in Nottingham, I believe it was, he said, are you in the same street as me? You must be next door with a signal like that. That made my day. Because I was so keen, I get up early on a Sunday morning. When I say early, I'm talking about six o'clock, half six, something like that. And of course, I'm out in the shed. That was my shack, the shed down the garden. I was out in the shack, tuning around on the 19 set, listening around 6.6 .6 megs. But of course, there was no one there. I, I was the only, <laughs> only idiot up early enough. And I, I was just tuning around, waiting. I wanted Sunday to start on the on the radio because it was that. It really was that much fun. Usually by about ten o'clock, someone would come on the air. They'd call uh, Echo Charlie, Echo Charlie. You know, this is one nine Bravo or whatever. And I go back one nine Bravo. This is four Alpha. Radio check over, and we'd make contact. And then other people would join in. And by Sunday lunchtime, sort of one o'clock, two o'clock-ish, there could be anything up to 20, 30 people actually in a huge net. And it really was fantastic. Now, bear in mind, this was before the days of CB. OK, CB hadn't come to the UK uh, in the 60s. That was much later on. So, I mean, there weren't mobile telephones, nothing like that. The only thing was amateur radio for which you had to have a licence. And that wasn't easy for a lot of people. You had to have the technical know-how to pass the radio amateurs examination. And even then you could only get a class B license. So you're on VHF on the two meter amateur band. If you wanted to get onto HF, onto the shortwave bands, you had to pass a Morse code test at 12 words a minute. Uh, they were usually taken at Coast Guard radio stations by a radio officer. That's where I got my Morse code test at uh, North Foreland. So if you didn't have a great deal of technical knowledge and you perhaps couldn't cope with Morse code, there was no other option other than pirating. I know I'm not making an excuse. As a friend of mine once said, there's no such thing as an excuse. There's a reason. So, 
So that's the reason people were on 6.6 .6 megs. And I suppose, in a way, it was good that they were all on one frequency rather than scattered all over shortwave, you know, anything from 2 megs up to 30 megs. At least they all congregated on 6.6. .6. So the authorities knew, they knew where they were. They weren't interfering outside with other things, although one or two were taken to court. And apparently the charge was that they were interfering in an aircraft band. But uh, that, that actually wasn't the case. A lot of pirates on Echo Charlie actually went on to become licensed radio amateurs. So it, it was, I was going to say it was a good thing in many ways. It was illegal, so it's got to be a bad thing. But it did help a lot of people become radio amateurs. It gave them a good grounding. They were learning all the time, learning about aerials, about transmitters. Uh, I built my own transmitter, crystal controlled transmitter for 6.6 .6 megs, crystal controlled AM anode and screen modulation, crystal microphone as always, burns on the lips. <laughs> that was my first transmitter. It was great. I was on the air with my first transmitter and I, my first call I put out, a chap came back to me from North Wales, a couple of hundred miles away or however far it is, and he said, lovely modulation. I can believe it. Lovely modulation. Nice signal. And that was it. That was my first transmitter. I went on to build others, more powerful transmitters. But everyone on Echo Charlie, uh, the majority anyway, you get one or two idiots that would play music, but they were soon hounded off, off the frequency. They were told, yeah, you're not wanted here. This is not what we do. Uh, people conducted themselves in a proper manner. Um, I, I, again, you might be thinking, well, how can they? It's illegal. You know, they, were, they were criminals, I suppose. But uh, I suppose you can have good and bad criminals, <laughs> put it that way. But you know, we learnt a lot. And I certainly went on later on you know, to get my amateur radio licence. And without that initial grounding, I think I would have had, had problems. You know, I, it would have taken me a lot longer to get my licence. So it's all, all very well shortwave listening, but it's not until you actually get on the air and you learn the procedure, you learn how to behave. Uh, yeah, that's, that's when I think you, you can then go on to take your amateur radio license, as I did. And I just, I didn't look back from there. In those days, of course, it was all AM amplitude modulation. Now, I mean, it went on to SSB on, uh, on Echo Charlie. And I believe Echo Charlie is still going today. I have had a, a listen now and then, and I have heard one or two stations, nothing like it used to be. But of course, with modern day radios, you know, you can go and buy an HF transceiver that's uh, opened up, as they say, so it will transmit and receive outside the amateur bands. You can go on any frequency you like, you know, license or no license, which again, isn't a good thing, it's illegal but people are doing it, but nothing like it used to be. 6.6 .6 megs now, Echo Charlie. It's still known as Echo Charlie, but uh, it's nothing like it used to be. Having said that, there, the amateur bands aren't as they used to be. They used to be packed. Uh, these days, a lot of people on the amateur bands, but nothing like they were in the old days. You know, you get dozens of stations on a Sunday on 80 meters, you, know, you could tune up and down the band, there's station after station, whereas now on a Sunday, yes, there are quite a few, but not that many. In fact, shortwave in general, the whole of the HF band, you know, from sort of two megs to what, 30 megs, it's a lot quieter. The trawler band has gone roughly between two and three point something megs. All the fishing boats, the shipping, the Coast Guard stations, they've all gone, or most of the Coast Guard stations have gone aircraft the aircraft are still there on on sideband on uh, on some frequencies the army they've just about gone there i don't know what they're using satellite communication there was so much to listen to on am back in the 60s and now it's all gone so though it's not just that the pirates have declined the radio amateurs have the, the entire hf spectrum is a lot quieter than it used to be. And broadcast stations, of course. You'd tune around the broadcast bands back in those days, and there's station after station from all around the world. Uh, whereas now, yes, there are quite a lot, but nowhere near the numbers that uh, we had in those days. 
Most of the BBC World Service transmitters have gone, along with all the relay stations they had. I suppose, apart from being hugely expensive to run all these hundreds of thousands of kilowatt transmitters everywhere, the internet came along and the World Service can now get to most parts of the world that way. But of course, not every single country has the internet. And there's been some discussion, I believe, about this where people are saying that you do need shortwave for certain parts of the world, which is a very good point. Apart from Echo Charlie on 6.6 .6 megs, there was also Delta Oscar on 5.33, maybe 5330 kilohertz. Delta Oscar was a CCF frequency. The CCF was the combined cadet force. Basically what it was was public school boys, posh schools, independent schools. They'd have a a kind of army unit there or a, I believe they had a, a sort of army sergeant or whatever who ran a, a radio station and the boys that were interested could get on the air and they had uh, as I say Delta Oscar was 5.33 megs Tango Golf was what was that 4.9 something can't remember it's so long ago and we would you know the pirates would talk to the CCF lads They'd come on about three o'clock in the afternoon when perhaps school had finished for the day. Sometimes they were around at weekends. Boarding school lads were still there, of course. You know, we, we would join in. I'd go on and I'd say, this is for Alpha. And if they didn't believe me, didn't believe I was a, a genuine CCF station, they thought I was a pirate, they'd ask you to authenticate. So they'd say, authenticate 2-9. And you'd have a chart every month. Every school was sent a chart. And you look up 2-9, like a, a matrix, and you'd say, I authenticate 6-4. And if you had the latest uh, chart, the latest matrix, you could look it up and they would say uh, that that was correct. A lot of us didn't have the correct charts, of course, so we were told to close down now. You're unauthorised to operate on this or any other frequency. Close down now. Out to you. And that was that. Of course, some of us knew people at schools and some of us were sent these charts every month. So although we were pirates, we could get away with it. We would authenticate correctly, uh, which didn't please some of the schools because they knew, they knew damn well that we were in fact pirates. There's so much more I could tell you about the, the good old days on the shortwave frequencies. But as this is my first podcast, I'm going to tell you a lot more about this in future podcasts. This is really a test. I wanted to see how I get on making the podcast, what the audio is like, what the response is. Do you like this or not? Do you want me to make more? You might say, no, Theo. what do you think so far? Rubbish. Get off. OK, so there we are. Thanks for listening. I hope to be back before too long with more stories about pirating and radios and activities on the shortwave bands from the good old days, as I call them the 1960s. So until then, this is Ray, G4NSJ from the Radio Workshop saying thanks very much for listening and goodbye.